gospel reading comes from Matthew 17, verses 1 through 9. Will you please stand? It reads, Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud the voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. You may be seated. So in the Gospels, we meet the disciples and we see how difficult it was for them at times to fully understand what it meant to follow Jesus. Um, Their response to Jesus represents a very human response, I think, and that's something that I can identify with. We can recall instances when they didn't always get things right, when things didn't always make sense to them. The Transfiguration story is a representation of that for the disciples. You see, in the passage preceding this, Jesus tells them that he would experience great suffering, be killed, and on the third day, he would rise. But Peter and Jesus had a little spat about this because Peter was not willing to accept the possibility of Jesus having to suffer and die. But at that point, Jesus was acknowledged as the Messiah and the Son of God by Peter. But in Peter's mind, a Messiah would not have to suffer. A Messiah was someone who would be triumphant in leading Israel against their enemies and establish God's kingdom on earth. So the concept of a Messiah who would experience humiliation and death seemed too disturbing to understand. So in this previous passage, Peter does make this confession about Jesus' identity, but he nor the disciples fully understood what that meant and why death was necessary. So six days later, the disciples who Jesus probably trusted the most went up the mountain with Jesus. His body then took on this transcendent appearance Then Moses and Elijah appeared. The Old Testament passage for today highlights the role of Moses as he served as the great lawgiver. Elijah, who we know was also a prophet, who was also instrumental in bringing people back to that order of the law. And we know that Jesus came to fulfill the law. Moses and Elijah are also paired here because They were both prophets who were initially rejected by many, but were vindicated by God. We also know that they both had mountaintop experiences, so it's befitting that these two meet Jesus here. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus talking together in a scene of transcendent glory affirms the fact that Jesus is in continuity with the fulfillment of God's work as represented by the Old Testament. So Peter recognizes that Jesus' dazzling appearance in the presence of Moses and Elijah is significant, for he says, it is good for us to be here. But he does not fully understand what he is seeing. He offered to build three dwellings, one for Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah, for all three deserved honor. Peter sees them as the same. 
but they are not. So then, the, then the voice of God speaks from the cloud, distinguishing him from Moses and Elijah as his son. So there were very important lessons for the disciples to learn uh, from this experience. You see, God sought to elevate their understanding about who Jesus truly was. Peter previously made the confession in the passage preceding this that yes, Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. But he needed to understand and embrace that. Jesus was the only Son of God linked to the prophets, but also set apart from them. And he was fully divine. Jesus was brought into this world divine. God didn't simply call Jesus. He sent Jesus to live and die so that we could live life more abundantly. Jesus is transfigured to manifest the glory of the cross and also to console the disciples in their dread of his death. We see Jesus preparing them for what was about to happen next. But just six days before this, Peter was upset when Jesus shared that he was going to have to suffer. So at this point, they're confused. They're also afraid. They don't want their leader to suffer. Then they hear the voice of God, and that scares them out of their wits. But for me, there's something so comforting about God's words to the disciples. God said, this is my son, the beloved. Beloved meaning the one whom I love and cherish. With him, I am well pleased. It's obvious that Jesus meant the world to him. And for that reason, Jesus was going to be okay. His task would be a humiliating one. It would be a painful one. But the disciples didn't have to worry about him because he was the son of God, fully human, but fully divine. So in their moment of trepidation, Jesus touched them and said, don't be afraid. Don't you worry about a thing. The transfiguration affirms the identity of Jesus. And we know that he was affirmed in a very similar way by God in the story of his baptism. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 6, it reads, And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he had come from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And again a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So obviously God was trying to make that clear. And in the passage preceding the transfiguration, Jesus posed this question to the disciples. Who do you say I am? And today I ask you, my brothers and sisters, who do you say Jesus is? Who is Jesus to you? But in order to understand who Jesus truly is as the Son of God, we must first come to understand who God is. In Exodus 3, God called Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And there Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent you. And God also said, Thus you shall say, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. But when Moses asked this question, What's your name? He was really asking God, Well, who who are you? Who are you really? And God responds by saying, just know that I am Yahweh. That's all you need to know. We come to know who God is 
through his works, through his presence in our lives. And I'll tell you what I know for sure about God. God is constant. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot be improved. He cannot be changed. He is who he is. God is the absolute standard of truth and goodness. And when God says, I am, he's saying, I am everything. I am your teacher, your deliverer, your provider, your healer. I am the one who will fill the void in your life. I am the one who will guide your feet. When I was a kid, we would sing this song in church. It was a James Cleveland song, and it said, God is the joy and the strength of my life. He moves all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He's never, ever come short of his word. That's who God is, my brothers and sisters. Our Lord sent his Son to lead us, and he reveals in his transfiguration the authority that he held as his Son. In the transfiguration, God said to the disciples, listen to him. This is my son, and I love him dearly. You must take him seriously. You must let him lead you. Listen to him without hesitation, for he is the truth and the life. Listen to him whom the mysteries of the law foreshadowed, of whom the mouths of prophets sang, who by his blood will redeem the world, bind the enemy, and break the debt of sin and the bondage of iniquity, who will open the way to heaven by the pain of the cross. God is calling us all to open our ears to Jesus, to be good listeners. But you know, there's so much power in listening But it's easier said than done, especially in our day and time. Listening to the spirit of Jesus that dwells within each of us can be so difficult because there are so many distractions. There's so much noise. So many things happening around us at any given time. I led a prayer class a few months ago, and we discussed how difficult it can be sometimes to even find quiet time to simply talk to God. So listening to that Holy Spirit, that still small voice, can be even more challenging. So I love TED Talks, and Amazon Fire has a wonderful app for these TED Talks, and I like to watch those before I go to bed and drink my tea in the dark. I'm a little weird like that, I drink in the dark. Um, But I heard a great talk about the power of listening uh, from Julian Treasure. And he mentioned the fact that we have two ears and only one mouth, which obviously means that we should listen twice as much as we speak. And I thought that was so interesting because I don't really know anyone who listens twice as much as they speak. And Treasure explains that we really retain only 25% of what we hear. And this could be caused by the distractions that I mentioned earlier, or perhaps we simply tune out the things that we don't want to hear. Either way it goes, listening is important. Listening has power. Conscious listening creates understanding and assurance. It's intentional. It requires focus and attention. It's a practice. Scripture prompts us to do this because the Holy Spirit is constantly speaking to us. There's something right now at this very moment that God is seeking to reveal to you. But if you're not focused, if you're not intentional about listening to that still, small voice, you might miss it. So we're preparing for the season of Lent. It begins this Wednesday, and I encourage you to embrace the season, 
to reorient your minds to Jesus. This season, ask yourself this question. What is God revealing to me, and what am I going to do about it? What is God saying to me, and what am I going to do about it? Or maybe there's something that the Spirit has already revealed to you, but maybe it scares you. Maybe you don't know what to do yet. So I encourage you to delve deep this season and embrace whatever it is that God might be saying. Let God speak and make a decision that you're going to respond. As Jesus was transformed, the disciples were transformed as well. They were fishermen, but became defenders of the faith. They were the ones who would tell the story of Jesus after his death and resurrection. They were the ones who would spread the good news of God's wonders and graces. The disciples were transformed to become God's great messengers. But God knew that in order for the disciples to step into that calling to serve as his vessels, they needed to develop an unbreakable confidence in Christ. We know that the transfiguration marks the beginning of Jesus' journey to the cross. Jesus had previously shared with them the offense that would soon transpire, but he needed the disciples to believe him. He needed the disciples to understand why he had to die and have confidence in that. The disciples had to be on board with Jesus. And they had to have faith because only their faith would enable them to endure what would happen next. Only their faith, their confidence, would enable them to speak up for Christ when it was time. We have also been called to have confidence in Christ because he has so much confidence in us. As he called the disciples, he now calls us. He's calling us to serve him, to show the world what it really feels like to be loved by him. When I look in the mirror, I don't know why God called me with my short, soft-spoken self. But I am so confident in my calling because he has so much confidence in me because he was confident enough in me to ask me to serve him. Not only is Jesus confident in you, but he's given you everything you need to continue to impact the kingdom of God. His presence will guide you if you allow him. The Son of God is living in you now. Everything you need is right here. So I encourage you, my brothers and sisters, to embrace his love each and every day. Allow his love to transform you and share that transformative love with every single person that you meet. Amen. In the quiet, in the stillness, I know that you are God. In the secret of your presence, I know there I am restored. When you call Each new day again I'll choose There is no one else 
does for me None but Jesus Crucified to set me free Now I live to bring him praise In the chaos In confusion I know you're sovereign still In the moment of my weakness you give me grace to do your will So when you call I won't delay this my song through all my days there is no one else for me none but Jesus crucified to set me Now I live to bring him praise There is no one else for me None but Jesus Crucified to set me free Now I live to bring him praise to this place this morning and you'd like to begin a relationship with Jesus but you don't quite know where to start, I would love to chat with you after this service. If you've got questions about membership, we'd love to talk with you about that as well. If you're in need of prayer, our Stephen minister will be here to your right and just know that anything you share with that Stephen minister will be held in confidence. Will you join me in singing the invitation song?